if I'd known we had half an hour, I would have uh, I cut and cut and cut because I was told only 15 yeah. minutes. So, um, so you already saw the, the list of what we're doing with our little, little group in um, uh, Nelson Mandela University. Um, so I won't go through that again, but the, the major focus of this presentation is the results of the comparative, comparative organic trials. Uh, four four postgrads working on those, uh, one already finished and four more who are still busy, and uh, three postgrads in Zambia, Uganda, and Tanzania. So um, I won't go, if, if people are interested, I can talk more about the theory of what we're hoping to do there, but I cut it out just because of, of time. But it is an urban agri-park agri that we are trying to plan, so it doesn't exist yet, so I thought, well, but the idea is to use the the sewage waste and to take the, the methane out and to take the um, to grow algae on the ponding system to extract the NP and K and then to put the algae in with the wood waste from our wood industry and the grass from the municipality and have uh, in municipal compost and then use that to um, supply the, the small scale growers in, in the peri urban areas so they can grow vegetables and we process them and turn them into um, uh, organic products with value added. So some very interesting ideas, but they haven't happened yet. Um, I'm doing a lot of work with participatory guarantee systems, and but it's essentially the, the book that I'm writing now, which is part of the reason why I'm here next week, I'll be in, in England with uh, Commonwealth Agricultural Bureau International. So the book pulls together the last 10 years of research that we've been doing and uh, looks at a food systems lens so it starts with six international perspectives on different aspects of organic and then 18 chapters by me and my students on what we found out in the last, uh, last 10 years or so. So it was wonderful to hear from Canada. I think you guys are on order of magnitude uh, more developed than we are in terms of, you know, we have a very small team and very small funds, but um, you have to start somewhere. I did, I did explain here, but I, I, I went through it quite quickly um, because it was the wrong presentation. But this is from a book I did with FAO, with Gunnar Rundgren and, and um, uh, Nadia Skialaba editing. And this was the chapter that I did called um, uh, Transforming African Agriculture. And we see the model of um, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, Millennium Villages Program, and the Export Program for Organic Products from Africa, which uh, Gunnar Rundgren and FAO and um, the, the Dutch, Bol von Elzaka, they developed over a period of about 10 years. And in, that, in the first, the, the, we, we compared a similar time, the first uh, six years, they spent that much. And the first six years, uh, Jeffrey Sachs and um, his great big program spent uh, a whole lot more. And um, <coughs> yeah, they, they reached 90,000. We got 200,000, or uh, um, Gunnar and the Ugandans got 200,000 farmers certified organic uh, within five years, and uh, at a cost of two dollars per farm per year, and Gunnar used to say it, it used it cost the Swedish taxpayer one cup of coffee each. Uh, that's what the cost of the whole program was. So what we're we saying out of this is three things. First of all, um, research in Africa in organics is hopelessly underfunded and under-resourced, and if we had more resources, we could really help a lot more. The second thing is that um, uh, the, it's become very clear that even the new green revolution doesn't work. You know, Jeffrey Sachs said, end poverty in our time. And if you read Nina Monk's review of his work, it's, it doesn't work and hasn't worked because you don't throw technology at Africa. The problem is not just technological. It's a complex problem of institution building, capacity development, market connections, and so on. So the third thing is that organics is very appropriate for Africa because we teach people to use the local resources. And the resources which they have are resources which are um, uh, available in, in the, the local economy. So first, you help them to make compost and look at soil fertility. Uh, second, you find the farmers that have a uh, little more knowledge and you support them to train other farmers and the whole farmer to farmer approach. And thirdly, as I said, very importantly, connect the farmers with the market, because if they are connected with the market, things begin to work. So that was uh, very exciting, but that was Uganda and uh, Zambia a little bit, but mostly Uganda. And we in South Africa have been much slower, um, but we have now over the last um, 
few years, we, I have got the first three lots of support from our National Research Foundation. And when we, when we got it, we were still Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. And we now simplified, we are Nelson Mandela University uh, because Nelson Mandela Metropolitan is Port Elizabeth District. And um, so we were allowed to use that name anyway, even though I'm on the George campus. But then we had to get special permission from the Nelson Mandela Foundation to be Nelson Mandela University. So we're very proud. We're the only ones who are a university that bears that name in the world. And it's quite a name to live up to. So the first project was my organic farming systems project, which I'll speak about more. Um, the second thing that we got going was the Department of Science and Technology, National Research Foundation, Center of Excellence in Food Security. Sorry, the security, we've lost our security. That's a, definitely a Freudian slip there. But um, the, and, and the third project is a project which um, is German funded where we are looking at uh, urban agriculture. So it, this is a big project. This is a, a, a project which has a, a budget of, of um, uh, many millions it's a, of rand. So, Probably the total budget is about $2 million over, over five years, and we probably get another $4 million in the next five years. We're near the end of the first. But we've got 11 South African universities, and we've got the Water Research Commission, our Agricultural Research Council, and quite a few overseas universities as well. And it's a very exciting project because of this uh, perspective. When you look at it, it's quite shocking that a, a, a wealthy country, a uh, relatively developed country like South Africa, has got so much food insecurity. We've got 14 million people who go to bed regularly hungry, um, uh, which is 2 million families. And uh, so food insecurity from actually being really hungry um, and to being sometimes hungry to being uh, not very sure where the next meal is coming from, that is all part of food insecurity, and it's a range. When you may have an adequate intrigue increase, but you're still a bit worried, then you are vulnerable, but you're not food insecure. And it's a very relatively small part of South Africa that actually is really food secure. It's quite, quite scary, really. Um, so the DST, Center of Excellence in Food Security, um, has got uh, five themes. The, the first four themes are kind of silos. So food creation, I'm doing a lot of work there with production, processing, and preservation. Food distributing looks more at the value chains. A couple of my students worked on there and livelihoods. Food consumption, health, nutrition, choice, and behavior. And this is a really important under-researched um, under area. So we, we're beginning to now look to food systems. Um, what is it that makes people um, change their diet? What kind of role models, what kind of information can we use to, because I have McDonald's just down the road from where we live. And on a Sunday morning, I go walking with the dog. And it's not poor people who are going to McDonald's. They come with the big cars, and, and they're big people. <laughs> and it's quite, uh, quite scary. So we're really putting a lot into that. And then we're looking at food governance, at what can government do. So you may have seen, and probably didn't make the news very much outside South Africa, but we had a massive listeriosis break, uh, break out, um, outbreak. In, uh, and we traced it back to Poloni. Poloni, factory Poloni, it's ground up stuff and they put all kinds of things in there and it was a, a failure of regulatory um, activity and the pathologists, the food, food scientists have been saying for a long time, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. So it happened, 700 people died and big scandal, but no surprise to us really. So those are four, as you can see, quite a broad um, uh, set of, of, of topics and then we have the cross-cutting issues that, uh, and we called it food contestation. What about the role of gender? Why don't women get as much service? The Ghanaians halved, they, they achieved the, the Millennium Development Goal. Why? Because they doubled the agricultural education budget and they put that extra money into training girls, educating girls from the farms. So instead of just the boys getting taught about farming, suddenly the girls are getting taught about farming. And they're also very much more linked to nutrition. And all of a sudden, over a period of, of 10 years, Ghana brought down uh, uh, hunger dramatically. So, and then identity, values, and ethics. So, um, so I'll just very briefly go through what did we do with our long-term trials. I got a bit of um, land uh, which the university allowed me to, to use. There were no facilities at all, so we had to put a 2.4 meter electric fence with a solar powered thing to keep the baboons out and to keep the, the wild pigs out. It's, it's 
plenty of things that come into damage. And we, we got in there and prepared the land and we did initial uh, trials looking at, um, we, when I, we analyzed, we, we, we set up 40 plots and we found there's quite a bit of vari variability which surprised us because it was a very homogeneous um, area. But so we said, right, we better plant an indicator crop. So we put in mustard, which also is a natural biofumigant, caliente mustard, to suppress the weeds because the weeds came up very uh, dramatically. And, but we knew the soil is very poor. It's acid, it's poor in phosphate, it's um, high aluminum, and um, we, we are going to have troubles here. There's not enough nutrient. So it started up looking very, very good, but very soon, um, the yeah, sorry, I pulled out a lot of the, the photos there. Very soon we found those, those mustard ran out of uh, steam. They first of all, uh, the purpling color because of, lo of low phosphate, and then they ran out of nitrogen completely. So, you, and that's what we expected. But we started off with um, four parts per million P uh, available phosphate um, with a pH of five, with acid saturation 16%, exchangeable aluminium fairly high. Organic carbon was very high. As soon as we plowed, that went down. We lost half the organic carbon. Um, so potassium was quite high, but again dropped a bit, and cation exchange capacity. So that's what we were before we did anything. Then after a year when we had, this, this got no fertilizer except a little bit of lime. All the plots got one ton per hectare of lime just to deal with the acidity and knock out some of the aluminum. So by that time, you can see the pH did go, change slightly. The acid saturation came down slightly. But um, after, um, uh, after th three years of um, trials, conventional had gone up to 31, which is acceptable. Uh, organic had been a big failure in terms of raising the pea. So we, we didn't, we, we put compost and we had a crop rotation and we thought we would be able to do enough there, but the acidity was just too great and the aluminium. So we then said, well, what do we have to do? We have to put in some rock phosphate, which people told me in the first place I should do. And I said, I want to see, I want to establish that you can't do it without rock phosphate. So having seen this, this, this result, we then, um, uh, we, yeah, the pH is, is slightly better, the acid saturation is slightly better, exchangeable aluminium, not much difference. Organic carbon was steadily growing a little bit more in the organic, only after two years. And soil K was a surprise to us, but this is partly because the, the pH has gone up enough that some of the potassium is becoming available. Cation exchange gone up. So um, just to give you, I'll go, go to the results in a minute, but just to give you an idea of the research setup, one of the students is looking at soil fertility and yield. Another is looking specifically at, um, at water down to 1.1 meters, uh, 10, 30, 50, 70, 90, and 110 centimeters. Um, every half hour, temperature and capacity and conductive um, moisture through capacitance. And we have a data logger and rainfall gauge. And we're also looking um, at the, on the surface, we're looking at the impact of mulch, so we're measuring just underneath the, the mulch layer, how long does water take to get under there? And we're also looking at, um, we measure every week also the, just the surface um, with the theta probe. So these are capacitance probes. We've got 21 of them in. The other theta probes that uh, we just go around each, uh, each week. And um, the, this is what the trials look like. So you can see your organic cabbages, your conventional cabbages doing well, your organic with the mulch and with compost, uh, if, but they only get the compost for the cabbage. Then we have sweet potato gets no fertilizer. We have cowpea gets no fertilizer. So the idea was to see does a rotation really work? And um, the, the rotation has always been better for conventional and, con and organic. Um, yeah, so I will, that's, um, so we, we also have a cover crop. So the organic gets a cover crop. As, as you heard other people, we have to put in, we don't have enough compost to give a good compost dressing, so we, we had a choice. We could, we could prove that organic is wonderful if we put 30 tons per hectare of, of compost, but the farmers can't do that. So we only use five tons of compost per hectare every third crop, just for the heavy feeder crop. But we do grow, grow an oat and cerradella cover crop afterwards, and we plow it in. Now, I never let a rotavator on my farm ever, but the, the, the machine that we normally used was broken. So in fact, here we are rotivating. Don't tell anybody that uh, we actually used a rotivator on our fields. It was, and it was interesting that the growth in organic matter plateaued as soon as we used the rotivator. So it had a bad effect on the soil microbiology. So this is the main result um, thing. And for those who are not 
familiar with um, crop research, I, I, I apologize, but I, I, I do want to, to bring a few things out of it. First of all, our, our average yield is, is 866 millimeter, our average rainfall 866. Year one was a little bit dry, year two was quite wet, and year three was very dry um, uh, uh, the, the year before last. And so, as you would expect, the chemical rain-fed agriculture followed from there. It went up and then it went down with the rainfall, rain-fed agriculture. But the organic bucked the trend. We had 20% lower, we went to 30% lower, then we fixed the phosphate and we closed the yield gap. In fact, the organic out-yielded the conventional. But in the next year, which we've just analyzed and I should have added it in, uh, it was a wet year and organic, um, uh, conventional out-yielded organic. So the same as Rodale found that in a, in a wet year, organic um, uh, doesn't quite get the yield that conventional gets. In a dry year, organic outperforms because of the greater moisture holding capacity and nutrient holding capacity. But then you can see here is the monocrop versus rotation. And you can see how in the first year they're about the same. In the second year, the rotation is getting better and carries on with the better. Same with the, the organic, first year the same, getting a lot better and we see a bigger effect, a bigger positive effect of the rotation um, there. And the control where we did no fertilizing, you can see it's very pathetic yield. So you have to do something and what, what we also, I think, have proved is that if you don't put some rock phosphate on, a little bit of compost alone for a small scale black farmer is not going to do it. You have to get the, the phosphate in there. So this is what has been lacking, to be able to say what kind of interventions do you absolutely have to do if you're a small-scale farmer and you have very limited access to resources. So we're quite happy that we have some results and that just summarizes what we, what we have found. With the pest and disease, all of the organic was biological control and we managed to control pests but not very well, but um, a lot more work is needed there. Um, and the, but the soil pea is, is, was the crucial thing for us. So I'll just tell a little bit about the moisture story that over here, the, you can see the organic normally has mulch, but in this particular season, I decided I want to see, we've just got our theta probes, we wanted to see um, is there more organic matter, is there, and does the organic matter, is it only the mulch that, that means more water in the soil, or is it also residual organic matter? So the three crops that we, that we did, um, uh, put mulch on, you can see they were much higher in this particular time where we had we'd taken, um, uh, we had had no, no rainfall for the, the past uh, two weeks, so it was quite dry in the topsoil and 21% in the organic, except where there's no, no mulch. But the no mulch is still higher than the average of the conventional, but only slightly. So you, and in fact, the, the no mulch was pretty close to the control, which, uh, so we can't, we, we did see, see a small effect um, related to between organic, um, organic matter in the soil and moisture content, it, it did correlate, but it wasn't statistically significant. But this is very obviously the big thing that the mulch is, is very much a, a big part of why the organic farming systems are doing better. So this is again quite complex. This is the, the output from the, the, the capacitance probes. And the top one is, um, is organic and the bottom one is conventional. And you can see you have a rainfall event and the conventional drops back very quickly. With the conventional rain, with the organic, the same rainfall event drops back much more slowly. So you're getting great, greater moisture retention. And these are the little theta probe readings so that you can see with conventional, we're going up to 25. With the, with the organic, we're going up to 35% moisture in the topsoil and dropping much more slowly. So all we can say is yes, the water holding capacity is definitely better in, in organic. Sorry, I see everybody's falling asleep, so here's a pretty garden. Um, I think we need some windows or some air con here, but this is uh, about the end of it. Um, but just to, to say that the third project, as I said, we've got the Center of Excellence in Food Security, we've got the comparative trials, and then we're doing this work on um, urban gardens. And this, she's the lady, uh, Auntie Eve Stoffels, they call her Auntie Cool. Because we, we, we helped these local women to get going with, they were, they were gardeners. And they said, we want to improve and we want to learn from the university. Can you help us? So we said, look, 
I said, I will put up 5,000 rands for a prize for a gardening competition and let's have, use that to spur. And the local newspaper got on board and the local wildlife society got on board with another 5,000 and then government came with 50,000 in prize money and all of a sudden this thing went viral. We went from 26 gardeners, we're now over 500 and they get their picture in the local paper because they've got a garden and look at this garden and this. And all of a sudden the youngsters are saying, hey, this is quite good. So they call it Tani Kool, you know, the, this Eve Stoffels because she's made gardening cool in our area. And they're small gardens, they're never going to make a huge difference to livelihood, but they do make a big difference to food security. So we're looking very much at this link between how do you move from being, a, being hungry to at least having some food security, that very first step. Then there's a the next step to becoming semi-commercial, and there's a the next step to becoming commercial, and that's very much the focus of our, my book is saying, this is how we were able to help people scale up and these are the exact factors involved and if we are serious in South Africa about transforming the agriculture sector, this is the kind of support the farmers will need and by the way, let's do it organically because we support a lot of other things at the same time. So thanks very much. Um, that's, uh, I don't know if there's time for questions.